Welcome to Reading the Room, a literary podcast featuring author interviews and discussions with bookish content creators. I am your host, Jalen, also known as The Bar in the Bookcase on YouTube. To put it quite simply, today's episode is a dream come true for me. I could not be more excited to say that the one and only Jonathan Franzen is on the pod today. Franzen is an all-time favorite writer of mine, and upon starting this podcast, I had him on my vision board of dream guests should I be able to get this podcast off the ground, and I truly cannot believe that this happened, and I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to talk to him for an hour. I hope you all enjoy our discussion. I ask him many craft questions and his thoughts on reading and writing, including about his latest novel, Crossroads, which was my introduction to his work. If you would like to support Reading the Room, I have a Patreon. Joining the Patreon gives you access to a bonus monthly episode of the podcast, which are chats with friends about literary discourse or other bookish topics. Also, you can receive access to my book club. I select a book each month, and you can join me near the end of every month on Zoom to discuss it with other Patreon members. If you miss it or cannot join, the book club recording will always be uploaded to my YouTube channel so you never miss out. Reading the Room is an independent podcast, so every member contributes to making this the best literary podcast it can possibly be. Thank you to all who have joined so far, and I look forward to meeting more of you at patreon.com slash reading the room, also linked in the episode notes. Other ways of supporting the podcast include leaving a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts, or otherwise sharing the episode with friends, family, anyone you know that loves literary fiction. Now let's get into the chat with Jonathan Franzen. Jonathan, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure, Jalen, and you should call me John. John, I am catching you at an interesting time, I would say, um, coming off of a press tour for Crossroads, which was published in 2021. It was my introduction to your work, and I was trying to figure out how I wanted to start this interview because I hold you in high esteem. You are one of my favorite writers. I, this has been something I've been very excited about, as my friends know. Um, and last weekend, I went to Taylor Swift's Eras tour, and as I was sitting there, I was thinking about you know a pop star of her level, and you know leading up to this interview, thinking about you and your place in literary fiction and being an acclaimed writer. In that tour, she's kind of like going around her different works and giving a sampling of her songs from each album and catering to her fans. And it's an interesting place for her as an artist thinking about what she's created already. And while this podcast, I'm not going to ask you questions about every single one of your novels, I do want to ask you about sitting here today and I guess being Jonathan Franzen and being a writer actively, how it feels to have this catalog under your belt and how that informs your daily writing. It's a very broad question, but I hope that makes sense. I would say I, I feel the weight of my published work primarily as, uh, you know, whatever it is, 11 volumes, none of which I'm allowed to repeat. And, uh, it's you know it's a it's a it's a blessing and a curse of mine that I just the minute I find myself doing something I've done before I lose interest in it radically and it's nice to have written six novels um, but those are those are six novels that I can't do again and and so I I feel I'm 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 getting pressed against a wall by the 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 sort of the weight of the existing work and i'm conscious of having less room to move um i'm conscious that i've i've used up much of what any writer can hope to have by way of native material a native or an, an acquired set of experiences so I think, it, and, and, and those books, I guess, might be what you mean when you say, what's it like to be Jonathan Franzen? Um, I recognize that I was the person who wrote those books. And the more recently I wrote them, the, more I, the better I remember being the person who wrote them. But it doesn't actually have much to do with my day-to-day -day life. It's like, OK, I created this thing. I created something of a persona as a writer um, and a reputation to go along with it and i'm aware it's i'm aware it's there but it it it's really feels outside of me that goes perfectly to my next question because it's it's about being a novelist as a vocation and just thinking about on the one hand you know the capaciousness of the novel as a form but also the limiting aspect of being one person um, and the continuous work of being a novelist and trying to create new things and 
Um, I was doing some research into some of your favorite books, and I came across one by Jane Smiley that I've been perusing. It's 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel. She says something really interesting, and I'll just give you the quote here. Um, and I wonder if it resonates with you. It just She says, each novel was an experiment in a particular form, sometimes a conscious contrast to the form I had tried last. I suppose I would say that the inventiveness and variety of literature itself produced a strong response in me. Each novel was my answer to a particular literary proposition, a particular method of telling a story. From that, and thinking about creating new, potentially original work, I'm wondering if you consider your novels as sort of individual items within your catalog, or is there like a certain connective tissue that's kind of connecting them as you keep going on in your career that's making some sort of like collective artistic statement, or is that not how you see it? Smiley's books are all recognizably written by Jane Smiley. I, I do recall that from the beginning, she specifically set out to do a different kind of book uh, each time. Um, some of that was, I think, formal. She wanted to do um, short stories, novella. She wanted to do a historical novel. She wanted to do a kind of crime novel. But you wouldn't mistake any of those books for Donald Barthelme or William S. Burroughs or James Baldwin. I mean, she's, she's still the same writer. And I think that's the through line. Um, it's something that, that, that lives in the way the sentences are written, the way dialogue is rendered. Um, you could speak of a style. I don't know. I, I'm not really particularly conscious of having a style because I didn't set out to self-consciously create a style. I found my way to a voice that sounded like myself. Um, but I do think that voice is, although it has modulated and has become less angry, less satirical, less sort of making fun of people or condemning people from on high, I, I think I, I, I can still hear myself even in the 27th city. And that's really the, the connection. Um, and then also, you know, writers have their own, each writer has his or her or their own set of preoccupations. I, I have a realist preoccupation. I like to do realist fiction, even when my premises are somewhat extreme. Um, I'm still trying to write recognizably human characters. And the question of how to live and what to do with the sensation that there is a right way and a wrong way, those have been preoccupations throughout. This is like the bulk of my questions, I feel like. It's just about character and tied to realism. I try to attempt to write down what I like about your characterization. So let's see if this makes some sort of sense. So what I love about it is that your writing avoids treating character as a being that experiences purely like externalities. You require each perspective of your characters to serve as some sort of like instrument for seeing the world in a particular way. And I feel like Crossroads as the latest one that I've been thinking about a lot is doing this particularly. And I think the contrast between those characters allows the reader, so myself, to fill the gaps between them and try to see what Jonathan Franzen as a novelist is saying in playing these characters off of each other. And I think the family as a dynamic is really ripe for exploring this. So I wanted to ask you about crafting character and if that, what I just said about that resonates with you. Yeah, I mean, one reason I write novels the length they are, I'm just not satisfied with a single point of view. And I discovered early on that if you have multiple points of view, the same set of characters viewed both from within that character subjectivity and also as an object to the other characters, a lot of interesting things start happening. Uh, one is always trying to maximize the, the density of meaning, the density of uh, internal connections in a work of fiction, or I should say I am always trying to do that. And, and multiple points of view just like that's, it, it's, it's a complete extra dimension to uh, signification in fiction, I think. How, yeah, how I create the characters, that's, you'll have to ask me again on that. But you, you said, what is Jonathan Franzen trying to say? Um, or what is he saying by presenting us with these characters? Franzen isn't really saying anything. 
he, it's not like there's a message. I have certain prejudices. For example, I think people are partly good and partly bad, regardless of their identity, regardless of whether they live now or a thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago, regardless of whether they live in Mexico or in the United States. That is, I mean, that's not a provable statement. Maybe some groups or some people in some particular historical era really were superior or really were inferior. But I think by and large, I have to work on the assumption that we're all pretty good and pretty bad. And, 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 and in a well-ordered world, we can kind of muddle along pretty good. Uh, in crisis, you can get tremendously good people, and you can also get tremendously evil people. That does inform the way I write. I don't like heroes and I don't like villains. And I suppose that could be a message in Crossroads. Becky is not maybe the most sympathetic character automatically, but I'm going to give you some reasons why she behaves the way she does. Um, I'm going to let you spend some time inside her and see her disappointment in life and see the way that disappointment has an effect on her behavior. That is actually a really interesting point because I have watched some interviews of yours recently in which you speak about kind of moving away from anger in earlier works of your fiction. And there's this argument that could be made that your novels are thus potentially apolitical in that they're telling the stories of fictional characters, their impulses, etc. And the narration is not necessarily commenting directly on social or political topics, even when the characters themselves are grappling with them inherently. However, this could also be considered political and that the novel is being democratized in your hands and that no one consciousness is being privileged over another. Do you agree with my train of thought there or do you not see it that way? Oh, many people, I think, including Toni Morrison, has said there's no such thing as a novel that's not political. There's no such thing as literature that's not political. If you are standing on the red corner twister dot of politics, that is absolutely true. But <laughs> that is not to say, and, and, I, and, I'm, and it absolutely applies to my own work. There is the conscious political dimension, which was really quite prevalent in the early books when I was that angry young man, thinking I could change the world with my novels, oh, exposing the negative moments of late capitalism and so forth. I, as I've moved away from that, there's a different kind of political signification that could be attached to these works. They are the work of a privileged straight white dude. And the more he tries to make an argument for universal human characters, um, characteristics, uh, and a, a kind of ahistorical, decontextualized notion that we're all kind of good and kind of bad. The more he tries to do that, the more he's actually engaging in his own kind of politics, a kind of conservative politics even. I recognize that that's, that's a legitimate reading but only if you're standing on that red dot of politics. If you move to the green dot or the yellow dot or the blue dot and say you move to the blue dot of art or you move to the yellow dot of spirituality or the green dot of emotions, the fact that, that all work is political, um, you can just kind of say yes and and go on. I'm really interested, maybe this goes to a question I wanted to ask later, but I think I would love to get your perspective on this. And just, you were mentioning before about having multiple perspectives in a novel and many characters. And I, I guess I want to ask you about your thoughts on quote unquote autofiction. I feel like I can attribute my personal desire to maybe start asking authors questions and thus me starting a podcast because I've been reading some books that were dubbed autofiction and I was really thinking about what that means in the form of a novel and this idea of even maybe many autofictional novels being plotless. I myself, I'm still drawn to these sort of narratives and I find them to be propulsive with, you know, a first person narrator exploring certain aspects of their own identities as rendered on the page. Um, and I guess I'm wondering from your perspective, 
I don't know if this is a conscious thought of yours, but as you know, a realist novelist who writes from many perspectives, like, do you have a, a reason maybe that you wouldn't want to explore questions of yourself through fiction? I know you like in the corrections, there's, there's certain autobiographical aspects that have been explored there, but I'm wondering in terms of like narration, why you don't feel inclined to do that if you don't. Yeah, it's never worked. Um, <clears throat> I am the anti Philip Roth. I have no interest in writing fiction about myself. As soon as I start writing, especially in first person about a character like me, I immediately begin to dislike that character and stop writing. I, I <laughs> why that might be, um, ask a therapist why it is that whenever I write about myself, I feel uh, it's not quite, sh I, it's, it may at a deep level be some kind of shame, but the effect is that I'm very, very hard on myself. And I, I, wanna, I want to sort of play up all the worst aspects of myself. And that's actually not realistic. And it completely at odds with my reasonable level of self-love. I mean, I, I, most of us who are not mentally ill go through life kind of liking ourselves, kind of loving ourselves. I'm no different. Uh, I do. So why is it that whenever I try to write about myself directly, I feel this intense dislike? I don't know. Part of the answer to your question is that I discovered that I could write essays. Eventually, I found my way to a tone for writing in the first person that made fun of myself in a forgiving way that I could confess things, I could actually write about those, the, the, the less attractive aspects of myself without making the reader feel like they needed to take a bath after hearing my horrible confession. If I could make it a little bit funny, if I could find that ironic tone, that self-ironizing tone, I could do it. Um, and that any impulse I might ever have had to be an auto-fiction writer, um, disappeared, one could say was cured by uh, <clears throat> my discovery of the essay. So there. But a really obvious answer would be, I'm just not that interesting. And I have, I have, I've written, like in total, if you take all the autobiographical bits, certainly the whole book, The Discomfort Zone, some autobiographical bits in many of the essays, um, the footnotes to the Krauss project, there's a whole memoir buried in those. If you take all of that and put, put it together, it's less pages than one of my novels. And that's it. I mean, I've pretty much said everything interesting I have to say about myself. There is, I'm a boring person when you get right down to it. I could maybe come up with 400 pages total of first person narrative that would pass my test of worth publishing. That's so interesting because sometimes when I'm, when I'm thinking about autofiction and, you know, the, the term fiction applied to that and, and trying to maybe think of a writer that might not want to write about themselves, relying on the fictional aspect to sort of, to use that as like a sol like solace for them to say, well, anything that I'm writing, even if it is about myself, I'm, I'm marking it with fiction. So that means there's like a, there's a distance there that a reader can never say, this is Jonathan Franzen in particular, right? And maybe- Yeah, but I want to take responsibility. So if I'm, going to, if I'm going to use the I, I'm going to say, this is nonfiction. I'm telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. there, is no, there is no fig leaf here. This is me talking. You don't like it, then it's not that you're not liking a character I made up. You're not liking me. Um, and, I, and that's the way I want it. There is a whole other aspect to this, but I interrupted you. Go on. Oh, no, th that was a good interruption. Thank you. Um, I, I guess just the last part of that, just to maybe think about the contrast between that and maybe the novels that you're writing is, I mean, do you, do you see your, like, your characters as certain theoretical expansions of yourself in different ways? Does that make sense, maybe? Absolutely. No, that's, that is what I learned the hard way about myself, is I cannot write a character like me, that if I can convince myself that a character is absolutely not me, then I can pour a lot of my own content, my own sensibility, my own deep psychological stuff. Um, in many cases, 
bits of personal history that that can all go in and it's not threatening. I don't dislike the character because I've established up front, this is not me. This is somebody else who I like. And it's one reason it's easier for me to do female characters. They tend to be, they come more quickly when I'm writing a novel than the, the male characters do because I live in a very gendered world. Um, and all I have to do is say she and some part of my brain says, okay, that's definitely not you. So you're free to like pour lots of yourself into that character. So yes, absolutely. The characters are, I am writing about myself and I am kind of interesting. I'm just not interesting at the narrative level. Most of my adult life has been spent sitting in a room writing or bird watching the last 20 years, super boring, or making dinner or doing email. I mean, there's nothing interesting narratively, but it's not like these have been dull years on the inside. So yeah, that's, that's the distinction. There is all this stuff going on beneath the surface of a person. And all of these unexplored potentialities, almost all of my main characters are people I could have been. For half of them, I would have had to have been the daughter in my family. But the male characters, these are all people I could have been uh, and, 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 and who I can write with some confidence because if I dig down inside myself, I can find... I can very well imagine what it would have been like to be that person rather than the person I am. Do you find that, again, this is kind of going back to reflecting on your catalog as a whole, but do particular characters ever feel, I guess maybe the better question is, do they haunt you or ever feel unresolved for you? Or is it is the narrative and how they're contained sort of, do you feel satisfied by the end of a novel with character, given you finished it? <laughs> a character is two things. A character is a, is a psychological object that one constructs in oneself and develops a relationship to the same way you make of other human beings psychological objects. When you are interacting with them, you're partly interacting in real time with a human being, but a lot of what you're actually responding to is what that person has become in your own head psychologically. So. And we all have primary psychological objects. Many of us have our parents as psychological objects. So much so that for the past 25 years, I've been getting to know my parents. Now that they're no longer alive, I can actually see them more clearly because they're not being obscured by what I have made of them in my head. So that's part of what is, and to, to, to do a big main character, obviously you have to love the, the character and, and like spending time with them. But there is, but primarily you are creating something you are in a strong relationship with emotionally, psychologically. So that's one half of what it means to create a character. The other half of what it means to create a character is to make marks on a page, which when read, deciphered by yourself or by a reader, give the impression <laughs> that there is someone there who is in fact not there. It's just marks on the page, which means that we're in the realm of something written. And once you're in the realm of something written, you think about, well, what, what makes a good character? What gets us involved with the character? I personally have identified desire as the most important thing. Characters who want something, um, are characters I can work with. Characters who don't want something that is going to create a story are useless. And so if you say, do I end up feeling like there's something unresolved with a the character? They are, they are as psychological, and I'll answer that in two parts too. Um, as psychological objects, they, unlike my parents say, or my ex-wife, um, <laughs> fictional characters as psychological objects have this way of disappearing the minute I'm done with the book. Um, I'm no longer in a relationship with them. And that is because, part two of the answer, they have been conjured into being on the page by a story about them. And if I've done my work as a, as a writer, then I have completed the story. There's an ending. I'm a big 
closure guy. I'm an anti-postmodernist in that respect. I strongly believe in narrative closure. And when you have that narrative closure, if you've, if you've, if you've done the work and written a novel in which you're basically satisfied that you know what has happened to the character you've been presented with at the beginning, then there's really nothing more to say. And also psychologically, there's nothing more to work with. You're no longer in process with that thing. I think I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit. Something you said previously about your s- style or lack of style that you've attempted to create. For me, as a reader, one reason why I love your work so much is that I feel like when I pick up a Franzen novel, I I can identify it as a Franzen novel. And maybe that's just my own assumption, given I already know it's you. I don't know if there's something going on there. But I want to ask you about your prose, if you can speak on it. And just to start, I was thinking about your prose in contrast with, say, poetry being arguably an, an act of concision or trying to contract language as much as possible versus prose expanding, leading from one thought to another in narrative. Particularly, I want to give a shout out to like Perry sections where I feel like things are let loose a little bit in terms of um, length of sentences and vocabulary, which I really enjoy to read. I love Perry as a character personally, but this idea of like thoughtful expansion comes to mind when thinking about your work. And I was rereading passages of Crossroads and I was trying to apply a level of like literary thought to it and figuring out how this is working. And I guess my question just goes to John sitting in front of the laptop, writing Perry scenes, Becky scenes, any character. How, if you can speak on this, again, this is abstract, but how does your, I guess, literary brain work on the page to render the experience that the reader has to create the story. Are you thinking about this actively while you're writing or is revision a core or primary aspect of creating that, what I think is a Franzen sensibility? Yeah, the revision happens while I'm working. I think I've fallen into a particularly miserable mode of writing in the recent years where most of my writing day is spent rewriting what I wrote the day before and then in the last hour, I bash out a page or two of new stuff, which I will then revise the next day. That work is, obviously I want it to sound right, but the the work is largely about not wasting a reader's time. So there are a number of filters that get applied to that page or two that I pushed out the day before. Sometimes in order to not leave the office having written nothing i write very hastily and there might be some there might be a cliche or two in there so the first filter is obviously get rid of any kind of cliche and and there are a lot of mechanical filters one wants to not repeat words inadvertently Um, one wants to vary sentence structure and length particularly structure these things have become automatic and reflexive to me. They're applied even when I'm writing an email. I, you know, I don't want to have two sentences in a, row in, a, in a row with comma, but in the middle of them. That's ugly. There are a million things like that, just how to write clean prose. Mostly when I say not waste the reader's time, it's I want there to be something happening in every single sentence and what can be happening really nailing what it feels like to be that person in that moment that's a thing that will work some little thought some little funny ironic thought i don't want the sentence to be flat i want it to have have a charge or occasionally something that might qualify as a handsome turn of phrase Everything else must go. Much of the revision, that first thing in the morning revision, involves just taking anything out that doesn't have to be there. I also am phobic about um, repeating words, not even right next to each other, but repeating words anywhere in the book. I will have to go through and see how many people are laughing, how many people are sighing, because I don't want to be, I don't want to sigh every five pages. There are some really tricky problems. Like you want to say he turned to her and said, "Well, turned and said." Oof. 
you really only get one of those in a 500 page book as far as I'm concerned. How many ways are there to say she was about to start to cry at the verge of tears, whatever. Um, you know, I'm writing books in which people are upset. People do some crying. I have to make sure that it that it's put in, put in a different but inevitable sounding way each different time. Another filter, I'm just kind of riffing here. Another filter lately has been, that's too fancy. That's too lyrical. I've always had some antipathy to lyrical writing, but that has become really ironclad antipathy at this point in general, which is to say antipathy to, to bad lyrical writing, which is to say the lyrical writing in about a third of the novels that get published every year. It's just bad. Sometimes you do need to resort to a kind of lyricism at a key moment, like near the end of the book, you're wrapping things up. You want the prose to swell and, and rise above that level of complete invisibility that I've strived for, for most of the book and actually kind of be worthy of the emotional moment. But by and large, I've even become a little hostile to simile and less inclined to use extended metaphors because I don't want people to be thinking about the writing. I want you to read three pages of the book, get into the story, and just forget that there was a writer writing it. Um, and yeah, here and there, like maybe some of the Perry stuff, you're aware, okay, this is pretty arch, although Perry's a pretty arch character. Um, but by and large, I, I just want it to be pure thought pure character, actions described minimally, and even then in a different way, even when I'm repeating the same action. That's a long riff, but those are a few of the things I'm thinking about when I'm revising in the morning. I, I was so curious to hear about that because this idea of, I guess, literary criticism and also just thinking about how people perceive your work. So right now I'm having, I'm very fortunate to be able to ask you directly how you attempt to think about your novels, how you revise, what your intentions are with your writing. However, once the book is out in the world, people can interpret books however they want to. And myself, I starting this podcast, one of the main reasons why I wanted to do it was because I've been having a lot of anxiety about how I think about literature and am I asking the right questions? Am I are my questions valid? Like even preparing for these interviews, I'm thinking like, are these the right questions to ask? an author. And what I've been trying to do is, you know, resort to literary criticism, see how other people think about fiction, and try to build my own understanding of it myself. And so I guess one additional point here is that I sometimes find that I, when I've read certain, I guess, pieces about your work, sometimes I get frustrated with how your novels are, are talked about. And this goes to, I guess, any novels that I've enjoyed. Um, but I, I'm just wondering how those forces do or do not affect you as a writer? They affected me once when I was young and stupid enough to read reviews. I think I've read two or three book reviews of one of my books since October 2001. There was just no point in it. Even a really positive review would have some quibbles, and I would forget all the nice things that were said and remember only the quibbles um, and be hurt by them. So, like, why would I submit to that? People occasionally send me, like, master's theses that they've written about some book of mine. Um, I looked at one, there was a woman in Germany, and she'd written about freedom. And because that was literary criticism rather than reviewing, and I do think there's a, a significant distinction to be made there. The reviewer is basically the stand-in for the reader who wants to know, should I read this book or shouldn't I? The, the critic is, well, this book has enough of interest that it's the, the object of criticism. So I don't have to, you know, I don't have to tell you whether you're going to like reading it or not. I can actually start thinking about some of the stuff in it. And I think that that master's thesis, I think it's also the only one I ever looked at. Um, it was making some just trying to relate freedom to Thoreau and Walter to Thoreau. And 
It was kind of interesting. Um, I'm not sure what the point of it was. I mean, I'm not, I, I imagine at one point that I might be a, a literary scholar myself. I came out of college all fired up about theory and, and thought, hey, it'd be kind of a cool job to just sit around and read books and write papers and teach a few students and get paid for it. And I could live in a nice Victorian house in a New England town. It would be cool. Um, I came to my senses in about six months. But what I want to say is that there's absolutely no profit for me in reading a book review. Criticism can be good, which is to say, Emily Dickinson's a really hard poet. She does not immediately give up what it is she's after. And it can be helpful if you sense there's something here in Emily Dickinson. This seems really cool and interesting. I don't understand it. You can get a lot of insight into D Dickinson by reading criticism of Dickinson. I do think that criticism is the more useful, the more difficult the underlying work. Shakespeare, very accessible in certain ways, quite inaccessible given that it, he was writing 400 plus years ago. And, and if you don't understand Shakespeare's world, if you don't understand uh, where he was coming from literarily, who he was writing for, how those plays were being produced, it's much harder to appreciate him. Myself, I'm a big Northrop Fry guy. His Anatomy of Criticism, his read on Shakespeare's comedies was life-changing for me. And I now go to see Shakespeare or I read Shakespeare differently because of great criticism of it. I think that is always there, but I think there's probably more, a lot more interesting criticism written about Kafka than there is about Tolstoy. Why? Because <laughs> Tolstoy has done the work and he's not trying to hide anything from you. It is not inaccessible. You can engage yourself, you and your reading group, your book club can sit down, read Anna Karenina and kind of get right into what he wants you to be talking about and discussing. Like, should we like Anna Karenina? Um, is this really a novel about the unfairness of divorce law in Russia, or maybe is it about something else? Is Karenin really maybe not quite the cold jerk that you thought the first time you read the book? All of these are really cool questions, but you don't need a critic to help you with them. Thank you for speaking on that. I, I have been trying, as I said, you know, to grapple with my own ideas on that, and it, and it kind of like reassures, or I've been reassuring myself that like, however a reader may experience something, I think is valid in itself as a intimate experience or an intimate act of sitting in this chair usually every night reading a book. I think there's something individual about those experiences that I that I've been trying to think about. I don't know if you have anything to say on that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, just to go on, especially with a book like The Corrections, that was written when I still had kind of one foot in that world of academic writing one foot in the world of difficult literature. There's a lot I put in. If you were to trace food through that book, you could, you could write a good college paper on the use of food and the corrections. And it's something you might not notice or might notice only in a fleeting subliminal way as you read the book. You could, if someone were to point it out in a critic-like way, say, oh, that is actually rather cool. I didn't notice that. Um, and, I, and do I put things like that in my book that might, part of it is, well, okay, several things. Part of it is uh, I'd, like a, I'd like my novels to hold up on a second reading. Um, like you might get stuff out of these books on a second reading that you missed on the first reading. But say you only have time to read the book once. Well, then it's nice to be able to read somebody else's analysis of it. I guess this is maybe a little self-indulgent, but I, I wanted to ask you about press doing this podcast, having a literary persona. I'm curious to know your thoughts on personally representing your work on public platforms and if this perspective has changed or not in recent years. And lately I've been thinking about an author, Elena Ferrante, and thinking about like if a writer makes a choice to be anonymous, what does that mean for writing? If you have ever wish to have proceeded in that way maybe and to not have to speak about your work or do you enjoy it kind of open floor question there 
The interviews get very tiring. Crossroads interview year was grueling because everyone had the exact same five questions. Even when I would say at the outset, well, hey, maybe don't ask why did I set the book in the 70s? Don't ask about the trilogy aspect. Don't ask about Christianity, um, unless it's, I mean, like, why Christianity? If you have something a little more interesting to ask, sure, go ahead. I could say all that, and here would come the same five questions. That gets really, really old. And I do it, it's a necessary job that comes with helping my publishers publish a book and promote it. Rare is the interview where I say, hey, that was really, really fun. And those interviews tend to be not, well, they don't tend to be about my novels. It's like, I wrote the novel. It's not that hard to read. What more is there to say? However, by the same token, I love doing public events. And I particularly like the audience Q&A. There again, you get many of the same questions, but it almost never happens that there are no interesting questions. Crazy stuff, things that I just get like, I have to stand there with a stupid look on my face for 10 seconds trying to think of something to say, the question is so good. That's fun. I also like reading for my own work. I like getting in a room full of people with the spotlights on me and putting them at ease and making them laugh. Uh, I just enjoy that, the, the, the performance aspect. If it were only that, uh, I'd, well, actually, I would do more of that if I could. Um, with the pandemic, I did almost no live events for Crossroads, and that was a frustration because nothing can replace that that atmosphere in a room. You're in a room for an hour with a group of strangers, and yet there's there's this connection, and it's really palpable, and it's it's conveyed. Well, I feel it most if if people are laughing when I say something funny, but um, but also then in the signing line, just be able to shake up the hand of somebody who is bothered coming to a literary writer's reading. Um, it's really great. I'm not interested in my legacy. I was a 14-year-old who took the long view of things. I was a 21-year-old who was keenly aware of my mortality um, and the finality of that mortality. I'm competitive. I don't like being ignored at the expense of writers who I think are bad. That irks me. But in terms of what I would be trying to achieve with this public persona, it's kind of meaningless. It's like, oh, I never won this prize. Well, yes, I won't know that when I'm dead. And who, who cares? I don't feel the need to be treated like anything but a fellow human being. Well, I want to say another thank you to, to come on here and, and to answer my questions and entertain my questions. Um, I, I tried in preparation for this to not ask you the repetitive crossroads questions. And I, at the risk of being abstract, I, I really enjoyed this. Um, so thank you for being a part of this. It really means the world. You know, Jalen, the reason I did this is you, you've got a good story. I mean, you're a lawyer and you once really liked reading books. You've gotten back into it. And this is your way of engaging with those books in a really serious way. I think it's great. And there is no conceivable professional advantage for me in talking to you. It was just that you seem like a good guy and I like what you're doing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.